looking at the patterns that I was recognizing when I was traveling, um, I started to see that there was more things that were bringing us together than separating us, right? And I saw that in not only a human aspect, but a technological aspect. I saw, you know, this verge and this rise of this kind of co-mingling between humans and technology. And as humans, we've always been around technology. Fire is a form of technology, right? It's only this through this scientific or this technological process where we create it at, and to be technology. Shoes are technology, shirts, um, all different types of elements of, of, of our everyday lives are technology. But what I started to see is that there was this exploration that I was interested in through the interconnections between humans, living systems, and technology. So cyborg anthropology is really around this framing. <laughs> Marcus D. Anderson is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Seeking to be globally impactful, Marcus created the World Education Foundation in 2009. Through this mission, he has traveled to over 81 countries and developed on-site programs in 21 of those countries. During this time, Marcus gained a plethora of knowledge and expertise at the nexus of indigenous wisdom, modern technology, and future communities. After writing a PhD proposal in 2017 focused on cyborg anthropology, Marcus accepted an invitation to participate in the Global Solutions Program hosted by Singularity University and NASA. He created Urban Matrix One, which utilizes satellite technology, unique data sets, and machine learning to provide actionable insights to climate challenges. With an RFID chip internally implanted, Marcus is a cyborg with a deep passion for ancestral wisdom, recognizing intersectional patterns, and creating personal and communal transformation in sync with natural systems. His expertise in these fields has led him to co-found ism.earth with Ada Paris, who was also on this show as a podcast guest, good friend and wonderful person, where they are developing a collab venture studio and several businesses around artistic expression, emerging technologies, regenerative futures, and rethinking policy. First pilot will be in, in the Tom Minor Basin summer of 2021. So right about now, coming up soon. More broadly, Marcus is a polymath, speaker, writer, and entrepreneur currently mobilizing his experiences to help multiple businesses, industries, and communities reimagine the future. He develops clear strategies and frameworks to solve complex challenges and articulates purpose-driven solutions through keynotes and client sessions. After choosing to leave a career as an elite athlete in the NFL, Marcus has inspired others to live their truth through the power of the pivot. Through his journey has embodied resilience, focus, sacrifice, and discipline to become a leader in multiple fields. Marcus, welcome to the podcast. It's so good to have you here. It's so great to be here, Mark. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, um, we run in very similar circles um, and Ada has told me such wonderful things about you. So I'm just really happy to be with you as well as your audience. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful that you're here. I'm so glad that you are. And, and you hit it on the nail. Uh, we really have run in, in a lot of the similar circles. So you've spoken at Twin Global. Uh, you have uh, gave a wonderful uh, um, discussion there. Um, you've been at Singularity. Um, we both know Ada. We, uh, I love her to death. Our podcast was fabulous. She, she, she's a, a sheer pleasure. And she actually says, you really need to speak to my partner on ISM. And we actually talked about ISM uh, on the podcast. 
Um, then there's, you know, there's Kinner Net. There's obviously Paul Hawk in the drawdown. I've, I've got his book here, Natural Capitalism. And you mentioned a lot, you know, that, uh, and we'll get into this probably um, in, in a minute, but you really have talked about it. It was an inspiration after you left your career in NFL or chose to to leave that you really read that and it and kind of got you to look at the world in different ways. Another good friend of mine who's been on the podcast, Cindy Chin from CLC Advisors, you've also spoken there. So uh, I, I don't know how our paths haven't crossed more or, <laughs> or we've seen. The, the other one is uh, Yaro Craner, the Hatch Experiences. You've been everywhere with Hatch and done, done things, the Hatch Experience, the Impact Labs, um, everything. And, and uh, it's just been a sheer pleasure seeing you evolve and grow and all the wonderful things that you're doing. Um, we're going to talk about the World Education Foundation, um, Urban Matrix One, and the many, many other things you do today. Um, but first of all, I could have went on for probably another hour just to give your bio and what you've done. You've really kind of tried to experience it uh, all and try to get out there on the ground, indigenous wisdoms, looking at different cultures, different countries to see what it's like to what's going on to make a clear assessment. You, you have a wonderful degree um, from Ling, Ling yeah. Schnapp. In, uh, Lynn Sweden, shopping. You, uh -huh. Lynn shopping, there we go, uh, <laughs> University of Sweden, and uh, you lived in Oslo, Norway. Today, you're coming to us from um, California. You, you're, you're basically a global citizen, but with all this in mind, with everything that, you know, kind of in this introduction and our past crossed, I've, I've really got to start with the question. We've just been through 15 plus months of absolute sheer craziness in any aspect that you could imagine, not just the pandemic, but many other things. And I want to know, how have you weathered the storm? And has all that experience, all those things that you've done in the past, have they given you a little bit more resilience or a better business model or operating model for life to weather this a little bit better than than normal or maybe others? You know, I can't speak about others, but definitely, you know, for me personally, this liminal space has been really, really um, almost confirmational, right? Um, I feel like the work that I've been doing has really been preparing for uh, this time, you know, where this liminal space of transition um, and transmutation and metamorphosism uh, is happening in a real way. And I think um, through that work, you know, I've really been able to hone in on my own personal um, kind of goals and what values that I have stuck to um, that have really kind of helped me to, as you mentioned, to be more resilient. Um, and then also, I think it really helped me to gather my tribe in a very specific way. You know, before you would have to kind of go meet people, be there at the conferences, be personal. Um, but this has opened up, you know, through the digital space, uh, which I'm very interested in, and that human and digital connection. But this, this space has actually opened up a lot of opportunities for uh, workers that have been, you know, kind of grinding at this for years and years to start setting some new platforms, some new pathways um, that could be beneficial for, for the future. Um, you know, during that time, you mentioned um, Hatch, and I was actually facilitating a lot of the global living rooms that were being offered. Uh, so Yara Kramer um, and the team there just did a magnificent job of bringing people together through the digital space to have conversations, to meet, you know, to have provocations, to um, do the emotional healing part of it as well, you know, because this was very difficult for some people. So holding that space um, and really planning what the future looks like, I feel like this was a, a, a really opportune time for me. I'm so glad that you're you're still here. You weathered it. Matter of fact, I I, I knew that, but I always want to hear uh, from you. I want to know how your experience was. I, I, actually, uh, our friend Ada, she had some some losses during this time, and and uh, I, I would have to say, yeah, it was pretty rough. But she still weathered it fairly good, with all, all considering. 
Um, and I, I believe a lot of that has to do with a good support structure and also a lot of experience on how do you get through times like this? How, how are we prepared for, for what's coming down the line in our world? And, and uh, with those things that you're doing and that you want to do for the world, I really think that gives you a better operating model to, to, to weather these times, but also to change those times so that in the future we have a brighter world to look forward to. Uh, having said that, I, I think we really should, should start off right away first to, to, um, to talk about ism. So Adam and I touched upon it and it was you guys were doing a lot of work and, and you've recently just done some some fabulous more work and i'd like to kind of touch upon that as well you provided me with with a nice video that i'd like to show it's about three minutes long it's narrated so even our podcast listeners will be able to to enjoy it and, and understand it but we'll put a a link in the show description so that they can go view it later and then i'd like you to tell us a little bit more about what's going on if that's okay with you indeed i think that's the perfect way forward thank you okay you bet here we go what type of ancestor do you want to be this is the question we orientate ourselves around as we embark on an exciting future. And as we emerge from this liminal space, we have a unique opportunity to reimagine what is possible. Through a considerate and concerted effort, we are creating a new narrative that revisits the past, acknowledges the present, and sets the containers and conditions to co-design a regenerative future. And we want you to be a part of this story. As we move to transform from the I human to the we human, ISM.Earth and the Common Ground Project are setting the course for reorientation to ourselves, our communities, and the planet. The results of bringing our hearts, minds, and expertise together is manifesting in our first five-day retreat on the Serene Anderson Ranch in the Tom Minor Basin. From July 27th through August 1st, we are inviting 18 highly curated anti-disciplinary practitioners to be a part of the ISM.Earth Collabs, which will operate as distributed networks of localized spaces focused on regional world building in four key areas. First is artistic expression. Second, emerging technologies. Third, regenerative futures or civic solutions. And fourth, rethinking policy. Through this experience, you will be guided through a proprietary framework that will enable you to leave old pathways behind, breathe and develop a clear hypothesis for change, grow through identifying the tools, technologies, models, and MVPs that activate your hypothesis for change. Activate the flow needed to create new rituals, habits, and behaviors, and the ability and awareness to ground all of these tools into mobilizing this transformation into your life, practice, business, research, and or community. The extension of this experience will be cultivated through additional collabs in selected places throughout North America, growing globally. Additional collabs will be developed to generate the resources to shift behavior, create new ventures, and reimagine our symbiotic relationship to the planet. Together, we will generate the resources to shift social behaviors, embody new language, explore mutually beneficial human-environment relationships, and enter into a novel community of change makers who are activating the regenerative spirit both in self and community. Join us. Absolutely amazing. Um, uh, you know, uh, breathtaking scenery, breathtaking event. Um, I, I can feel it there. Thank you for sharing that with us. I don't think um, that I'm, I'm not sure how you could follow that up and say any more, but it's up to you because I'd like you to kind of frame it a little bit more for us and 
and get us up to speed, but who didn't get that must not have been watching or listening. Yeah, you know, thank you. I, I you know, super excited about this project. You know, I think that this has been a culmination um, of a lot of the work that Ada and I have been doing over the years. Um, you know, really being able to hone it in on something practical. So it's kind of like you have these visions and you start to recognize patterns. And uh, what you want to do is be able to bring that down in a very uh, tangible way. And I think this gives us the opportunity to, to bring all of these ideas of how do we create these regenerative communities. And I think Ada and I's work, you know, really surfaces around that nexus of indigenous wisdom, modern technology, and what does future society actually look like? And it takes more than just one or two people. So you have to have the space and the place and the land um, to really bring those individuals, anti-disciplinary individuals together um, as a catalyst to creating this change. And it may start with a small group, but as you start to build and exchange ideas, we really look at this actually expanding and starting to catch, um, you know, and really hold the conversations and do the work uh, which is needed to actually create these better futures. Um, so super excited about the project. Um, you know, we're really forming and looking at it as a land operating um, type of uh, collab uh, where we have these different tentacles that are feeding into ism.earth where we can start to expand some of these larger ideas and really bring them into uh, reality. That's so beautiful and I really appreciate you you sharing that with me for probably I would say well before the pandemic so for at least the last two years the intensification of speaking about regenerative regeneration matter of fact we're both uh in some respects kind of fans or see paul hawken as a mentor his new book that comes out in september is called regeneration um mm -hmm. i i spoke for sustainable brands kuala lumpur thailand and uh yokohama japan and at all of those events, the, the theme was regenerative futures, regenerative economies. Um, the, the only thing that I, I really think is always funny, uh, and this is also where the trend has taken us for a long time, is when they ask me to speak, it's they believe that I'm gonna only speak about regenerative farming or regenerative mm -hmm. agriculture. And, and that's kind of the biggest myth or misconception because regenerative is a part of a symbiotic earth. And I know this symbiosis is really something that you and Ada talk about as a, a lot as well, but it's, it's about a regenerative economies. It's, you know, I've even heard uh, not just Paul Hawken talk about it, but also John Elkington who wrote, wrote Green Swans talk about regenerative capitalism um it's really about every aspect of life humanity economy ecology environment that has to do with regenerative and um and regeneration of our worlds and so it, it's really interesting that that is um finally we're seeing the tools from you and from is ism on that so i i mean what what are some other things that you're excited about as far as this moving forward, do you already have a lot of people who have already signed up and how many places are there and, and, and who, who are the people you're looking for to attend this event? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, just to speak on what you spoke on just uh, recently, um, you know, through every year, my work really continues to come closer and closer to leaning on indigenous practices. Um, so when we spoke, talk about regeneration, it's really about not sustainability because if we sustain what we're doing right now, um, it's not gonna lead us into the place that we really need to be. And, it, and regeneration is really the ethos of getting back to the symbiotic relationship, right? And really looking at the relationality between humans and all living systems. And with respect to the Blackfeet Nation, you know, we really wanna flip Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, switching the, from a focus of the I human really to the we human, right? And create those containers and conditions which allow us to operate within that we ecosystem. And I think when we're talking about 
ism.earth and we're talking about the land work and the ecology and regeneration we're really talking about bringing those individuals that have different pieces of those of those elements right so if we talk about ether fire water air you know uh, um and and we start to get in an earth we start to get into you know what are the elements that we need to go remember you know, in order to map on what we need to do right now to build those futures that we need in the future. So, um, you know, in from July 27 to August 1st, you know, we're bringing about 18 anti-disciplinary individuals together on the land. Um, Malou Anderson, Daniel Anderson have been our co-partners, co-conspirators, and they actually owned a large ranch in the Tom Minor Basin. And they're just doing some phenomenal work about bringing these concepts together and bringing these people together, healers, change makers, technologists, um, you know, uh, agronomists, um, you know, uh, Aquarians, um, uh, all different type of individuals that uh, you would think may not have overlap, but once you get them in the same space, have them orientated around, you know, what it means to have a symbiotic relationship to the planet, then you start to create this magic, right? So our job is really to facilitate and to bring our experiences together to really activate this group of individuals that can carry the water forward. I love that. Uh, are, are they related to you at all, Anderson? Or is you know what? It's, uh, maybe somehow, some way, but you know, that's another confirmation, you know, from the universe and um, that they're the right people to work with, you know? Um, yeah. And I think through that connection, um, there's just so much resonance. Um, so just super excited to work with them. Uh, wonderful great. people. They're doing great work there. Yeah, that, that, that's fabulous. You know, a, a lot of people, so you brought up some very interesting things. I'm very passionate about this and speak about a lot. So not only did I speak about regenerative a lot, and a lot of people misunderstand that the, the word regenerative really means creating conditions conducive for life to continuously renew itself, to transcend into new forms and to flourish amid ever-changing life conditions. And, and I mean, we could go on and on about about that, but it really, for me, comes from, and I don't know if, uh, for, for Ada or for you uh, where, where it comes from, but it comes from Carl Sagan's first wife, Lynn Margulis. She uh, um, was the most brilliant female scientist of, of our time. Sadly, she's passed away. Um, but she wrote, you know, Carl Sagan wrote The Cosmos and, and had the series The Cosmos. She wrote The Microcosmos and kind of told <laughs> us how, how our world works. And, and, you know, I've got her books here, too. This is The Microcosmos from, from Lynn Margulis and, and also The Symbiotic Planet. And she did a movie, The Symbiotic Earth by Lynn Margulis. And, and uh, really a fabulous person, but she she really pushed back against this thing that there is no neo-Darwinism. There is no neoliberalism. There are, there is no such thing as natural selection, survival of the fittest, only the mm -hmm. strong survive severe competition. It's the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Our world thrives and flourishes right down from the beginnings of life on earth to today with cooperation, co collaboration, one, one organism's waste is another one's food or energy. And this, this symbiotic relationship with everything in our world. And that's really how, not only how we thrive and flourish in our world and re use the process of regeneration, but also how um, we can go truly far at solving our global grand challenges instead of saying, Oh, it's their fault and the others did it. And it's not my responsibility. It's kind of allows a, a different way to view and interact in the world. Um, and so I love how you bring up the symbiosis and the symbiotic relationship because it's so vital. Was Lynn Margulis also an influence in your life or did it come up some other way for, for you guys? Yeah, you, you know, um, I, I think we leaned a lot on some of Lynn's work, but also Fritoff Capra, um, you know, he speaks yeah. a lot about living systems, right? Um, and this is from the macro, so looking at how cellular 
um, um, you know, biology works, you know, all the way to the cosmos. So it's similar, you know, to this macro micro uh, relationship, uh, but it is these patterns, it is these connections all the way from the quantum to the macro about how living systems actually function around one another. So Lynn has some great work, um, but also Friedhoff Capra um, has been yeah. a big influence in how we approach that. Yeah, I'm a graduate of the, the Capra courses from Fritz Hof Capra, and he's actually one of the co-authors in my book, a, a contributing author in my book. He actually got the, the symbiotic earth and the symbiosis from Lynn Margulis. He actually knew her. Um, also, uh, Jim, uh, James Lovelock as well knew her, and Lynn Margulis was a big big fan and our friend of James Lovelock who did the Gaia uh, theory basically and wrote the book Gaia and he's 101 years old now he just finished a new book called <laughs> Nova Scene but yeah I love Fritz Hof Capra and actually went through his course the systems view of life mm -hmm. and it's a fabulous course I would highly recommend it to anyone but that's a I noticed I, I did see that uh, just recently on on Ada's profile that she had taken that course from him and become an alumni as well. And he he is a wise man beyond his years. Um, interesting story, and I don't want to get too far off on a tangent. He his one of his first books was the Tao of Physics. And um, it was a book when I was just a little kid that was on my parents' bookshelf that I looked at many times. And, and I ne I'd never read it at that time, but I saw it on the shelf. And uh, the wisdom has been around for a long time for since, I, since I've been around. And uh, it, it wasn't until probably um, after I took his course and read his books that I that I went back and asked my my parents and says, why didn't you tell me about that book? Why didn't you tell me about him? I took his course. It was fabulous. And I learned so many things. If I'd had this wisdom back, <laughs> at, my whole life could be different. You know, my whole way of looking at the world could be different. And, and uh, it's this collective intelligence, this uh, collective learning that we get through through that. And that's really why, why I've got you here today is to talk about the World Education Foundation and many other beautiful things you're doing here is how we get education, how we learn, how we grow this collective intelligence and learning into other dimensions and, and, and really thrive. Because from a Western world standpoint, um, in some respects, that, that system's broken, but it's a lot better than the developing countries uh, that really need it where you've been in those 21 countries and, and created projects and done different things around that education. How, how did that all come about and how does it tie to, to you reading this book <laughs> from Paul yeah. Hawk and Natural Capitalism? Sure thing. You, you know, um, in a previous life, I would like to call it, um, you know, my first professional career was American football. Um, and, you know, kind of my focus was, you know, having blinders on to really embody what it meant to be a professional athlete. And through this, um, you know, kind of experience with myself, I found out a lot about the world. And it's kind of like Lynn's work. It's kind of like Friedhoff Capra's work where you took myself as the micro, right? And started to see how I could translate a lot of that work into the macro. So my first international trip was actually when I was at UCLA going in from my junior year to my senior year where I went to Nigeria, Lagos. And when I got off the plane, I saw the largest sun that I had ever seen. It was just this brilliant orange and this smell that was just so familiar to me. And at that moment, I saw and felt that the world was so large but at the same time, very small and very connected. And so through that experience of actually being in other places and sharing other spaces and seeing how other people operated, I started to get that tingle. And I think that's where it started to germinate that you know there is another side outside of just myself being a professional athlete uh, or having that desire to be a professional athlete. And I got drafted by Green Bay Packers, played for the Oakland Raiders. And then one of the teams that I ended up with was the Denver Broncos. 
And while I was there, you know, I really got into a lot of uh, Charlie Rose and listening to a lot of the interviews that he would have. And then I came across Amory Lovin. And Amory Lovin, you know, was talking about uh, the end game uh, with the oil, big oil and things of that nature. And I started kind of doing some research and one of the books that he co-authored was with Paul Hawken. And, you know, looking at natural capitalism, this was one of the first books that really started to uh, piece together some of the solutions that were needed in order to get over the hump of things that I was thinking about, right? Ever since I was little, I was kind of a systems thinker and recognizing patterns, seeing in shapes, colors, sounds, symbols, but being able to articulate all of those elements into a very digestible book on how to take steps forward um, it really started to fill some of the gaps for me. So this book, Natural Capitalism, was you know almost like my Bible over those years, and it really encouraged me to make the transition from football to the world um, of traveling and connecting with people and developing projects in different countries because I knew it was possible and I knew that there were elements, not just theoretical, but that were actually factual to help individuals uh, in places all over the world. So that's really kind of what and how that inspired me. That's so beautiful, and uh, I'm I'm glad you told us that story. And, and you know, for those of us, our listeners on in Europe, so played for the Denver Broncos and uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute and Lovins is and and Colorado, uh, Denver, Colorado, right? No, yeah. it's in mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's in in Denver, Colorado. And so the, and the book, so that's where Lovins is and the Rocky Mountain Institute. So there's a lot of ties and a lot of things came to place. And then the blinders came off. I actually um, took a course for OSHA, Occupational Health and Safety Administration as a instructor trainer for, for environment, for health and safety and environment at the Rocky Mountain Institute, which was really interesting. And um, the other author is Hunter Lovins in the book, Natural Capitalism, and she's going very strong. So I, I just, the, that journey and that you also, you could, in the words and what you read and that journey is you can see that it had a profound change and connected you to, to our earth and to look at the world in a different way. Um, it really, and I believe I know the answer because you know you're in California. You've li- you've been to 81 countries. You've got projects in 21. You've you've kind of traveled around. Obviously, lived in different places as well for for your f- football career and and after that. Um, how do you feel about being a global citizen? And what would you feel like if there was a world without nations and borders and divisions of humanity one from another? Do you think that would be a positive thing, a negative thing? Or what are your general feelings about global citizenship? You know, I I think global citizenship is necessary. Um, You know, I think the largest bit of learning that I've been able to glean was through travel. Right, you know, being in a tent, you know, with an elder and sitting down having a cup of tea, um, you know, in the middle of a Syrian refugee camp in Iraq, or being in the middle of the jungle, um, you know, in um, in the DR Congo, or talking to miners, artisanal miners, you know, in Kowazi, uh, where a lot of our uh, cobalt uh, comes from. Um, And I think through these experiences and through these conversations and through this human connection, we start to really embody uh, what it means to be human, right? What it means to be here, uh, the, the miracles that it takes to have this experience, the symbiotic relationship that you need to have in order to survive over a millennia of time. You know, so when you travel, I think it opens up your mind to what's possible. Right. So through this liminal space of what is possible, you start to see that there's a lot of connectivity through the human aspect when we start to just relate 
right? And we start to um, bring in that diversity and it really starts to challenge us. So it is difficult, it pushes, it pushes us to our edges, but that's where some of the deepest learning actually happens when we're pushed to our edges, when someone views the world differently, when we can have those conversations about how they view the world and then start to come to some type of co-relationship or co-reality that can actually co-emerge. Um, so I think, you know, boundaryless borders is something that I'm heavy into, um, but I think the diversity of, you know, uh, of, of the human experience is needed. Um, it's all throughout nature, it's natural, um, and I think it all contributes to the larger um, uh, canvas of, of who we are in, in this experience here. You, you've uh across many different circles many different groups and you you speak about elders and and the symbi symbiosis symbiotic earth as well I, I i there's there is some not dilemmas but or, or controversies but some confusion a little bit sometimes around indigenous elders or elders or indigenous peoples uh, one of my good friends is the head of all indigenous uh, people in, in the world, uh, Hindu Umaru Ibrahim. She's with the United Nations. She's a sustainable development goal advocate and I actually have an indigenous group in the United Nations that gives the voice and she meets with all these indigenous people around the world. Um, but if we crawled out of the primordial soup of this earth, if we come from this earth, a symbiotic, uh, homo symbiose, so to say, and and we um, really all walked out of the plains of savannah, the savannas, and and um, we're still indigenous, but does that have any kind of divisiveness where you say, well, we're we're not respecting this indigenous wisdom, this knowledge? Aren't we indigenous as well? Didn't didn't we crawl out? Or what's the distinguishment distinguishment uh, that we need to kind of understand, or the separation, or is there no separation? Are we all global citizens? Are we all on this spaceship Earth, and that we should be protecting those indigenous rights because we're part of that? What how, what's your view, and how do you see that? Yeah, I think it's all about the connections that we need. And you talked about it, this primordial soup, right? So when you have the combination of uh, fungi and algae, right? They have this symbiotic relationship that creates lichen, right? And I think through that aspect of, okay, I'll give you a little bit of sugar if you give me a little bit of carbon, I'll give you a structure if you give me my material. And I think that exchange and that kind of uh, symbiotic relationship is apparent in all of the things. Right. But then what happens is, is that we have this concept called the ego. Right. And the myth of the ego. And I think this myth of the ego really starts to create this bulwark between us and everything else. Right. It individualizes ourselves in a way that we feel like we don't need things outside of ourselves where, you know, we look at Maslow. It's all about I need food. I need shelter. I need education. I need these things where indigenous practices really lean on the relationality, not only to themselves, but to their community, which results in kinship but then furthermore, the symbiotic relationship with the earth, right? And I think when we start to get back to that indigenous way of thinking and relating to ourselves, our communities and the earth, that's when it opens up a plethora of understanding that we are all the same. We are all part of the same organism and we are a result of the technology of this billion and billion and billion, five billion years, um, you know, old mechanism called the earth. Um, and I think when we start to look at it like that, some of the smaller, minute political things that we argue over that disconnect us, um, you know, really start to uh, fade away and be a little less relevant. I absolutely love how you, you clear that up and you say it so elo eloquently. You also have some ties to the Buckminster Fuller Institute, Bucky Institute, and and really, you know, uh, you you mentioned this on your website, and I've heard heard you say it before. Ada refers to it as well. You never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something uh, 
build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. How are your ties to the Institute and, and, and why does that, does that even come about? I mean, uh, just, just a couple more caveats to that as well. So we've talked about Lynn Margulis. We've talked about Fritz Holf Capra, the guy who term, termed the phrase um, spaceship Earth was not Buckminster Fuller. It was actually Kenneth Boulding. And this is one of his books he wrote with his, his wife. And then the second one to write the manual for Spaceship Earth was Buckminster Fuller, who really set it in stone and laid it as a foundation that we're all in this Spaceship Earth. But I just want to know kind of your ties. Why is it important? And, and why do you look to that type of wisdom or that role model um, for things that you guys do? Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, I've been tracking Buckminster Fuller, you know, for a while. Um, and I just love the way that he actually set up um, this connected Earth, right? This Earth, this spaceship Earth. And that really resonated with me. Um, but, you know, when I met Ada, you know, and we became partners, um, we created a small curated group and she was actually in the Buckminster Fuller program with the design science studio. Uh, but through that, we started to curate a group of creative uh, to create a hyper-realistic immersive experience to really ask the question, what kind of ancestor do I want to be? Or what type of ancestor do I want to be? And she submitted the, you know, the first part of the trailer to the Buckminster Fuller Design Science Studio. Um, in the first iteration, we began with a soundscape that really takes you through an experience from the I human to the we human, which I mentioned. And I think through this journey, we are approaching the dissolution of the ego in the metaverse. Really what we spoke about by setting the containers and conditions to really leave old mindsets and programming, uh, really breathe into a new form and a new orientation of what is possible, um, and then grow in a new kind of kinship to community and planet. Uh, really flow with the symbiotic relationship that we've touched upon um, to everything around us and really ground as a mycelian network of moving together to create better futures. So through her participation and through, you know, some of the work that we've been gleaming to push that project forward, um, you know, I, I was open to, you know, a lot of the individuals that were working in that project, in that program, um, and really leaning into some of the um, information that they were gleaming on. And it's just a wonderful group of individuals that are doing some wonderful work. Um, and, you know, I'm just inspired and wherever I can help to kind of push that message forward, um, you know, I'm ready and available. That's so beautiful. And, and um, Ada really, we, we talked about that as well on the podcast and she's, I, I mean, everybody were referring a lot to that podcast. So they probably got to go out and listen to both of them, but more so to get out to your websites and, uh, see how they can be involved and, and look at the great tools and things that you're offering for humanity, especially those in need who really want to make an impact and change and, and, and see what tools they need to, to become part of this symbiotic earth and to help with the regeneration and restoration uh, of our world and of ourselves. It's a lot of, a lot of inner healing in order to reach that outer healing. Um, that kind of really brings me to a, a, a bigger kind of a question or feeling to see what you're sensing. You move around in a lot of circles, you speak at a lot of events and, and things, and you, you talk about your foundation and your mission and, and what you're doing with ISM. But for the past few years, I personally have been feeling this dis-ease or this unrest and humanity all over the world, everywhere I go, that they're not totally satisfied with those civilization frameworks, those structures that they're currently living in, that they're just not working for them anymore. And um, we've had more than 20 civilization frameworks that don't exist anymore. They're not any more here on this earth, you know, uh, Greeks, the Romans, Incas, Aztecs, Mayas, on and on. And because of ecological or environmental collapse, uh, now I'm almost feeling 
the verge of another collapse or an extinction event. And we've heard it said, you know, the, the sixth mass extinction, we're in the Anthropocene. I want to get your feelings. Do you also feel that we're on the verge of some major unrest, a collapse, an extinction event? Um, and how is the current civilization framework that, you, that surrounds you working for you do you believe there might be a new one emerging or coming or, and what does that look like? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, when, when I think about growth, you know, I think about condensing and contracting, right? And I believe just as every living sig sim signal actually has to condense and then extract, I think that's what our realities actually go through at the same time, right? Is that we have to restrict in order to expand. And I think through that transformational aspect, that's where the metamorphosis comes, right? If you look at a butterfly, you know, it goes from a caterpillar and it actually has to dissolve itself. It actually has to die in a way in order to reconfigure itself to becoming a butterfly. But when it, once it emerges, it's one of the most beautiful things that, you know, creatures or insects that uh, the planet has blessed us with to watch, right? The variety of them. But in order to get there, they definitely have to dissolve. And I think transitions are a great place for opportunity, right? It almost kind of lets you uh, revisit the past and really start to set new frameworks for what we're going through right now, where we can take us into a better future. Um, and it's up to us as the human species to either get in line with that transformational shift that's happening, because I can only imagine that that uh, the, the transformational shifts aren't just happening here on earth, right? They're happening throughout the cosmos. There's different information that's being downloaded and exchanged throughout this larger system. So it's really about us being in alignment with this larger transition rather than trying to fight it and or to, um, you know, create our own realities that aren't in alignment, you know, with this larger um, type of uh, research. And I think, you know, the research over the years that we've understood is really synthesizing the connections between colonialization, capitalism, and climate change. Um, and, you know, and I've really kind of coined this phrase as the ecological triptych. And I think through this triptych, we identify colonization as the ego, right? It is the ego that says, you know, we can do whatever we want. The world is ours. We can take over. We don't really have to be mindful about this symbiotic relationship. And capitalism is the function that really drives this ego. So if we even we look at it in computational terms, it's almost like this reinforcement learning that, hey, you do this thing, you extract, you get a reward. Hey, you disconnect, you get a reward. And I think over time that capitalism really starts to drive a wedge in between what is possible for this connection. And I think, you know, through the result, you get things like climate change, right? Or at least the acceleration of climate change. And I think, you know, when we start to understand this triptych, we can start to piece like say, hey, you know what, we may need to subside on the ego and really come up with new frameworks of capitalism or socialism or regenerative capitalism to really be mindful of this larger organism and our place and our orientation within it. Boy, you just, you've got all the answers. I really love it. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Do you believe that there is a moonshot, an earth shot, a, a, a plan that will really align us and get us to where we need to be for resilient, desirable futures, for regenerative, desirable futures? You know what, I, I think it starts with communication. I really think that it starts with this demystifying of the ego. Um, I think sometimes we get to, you know, in, in kind of this technocentric world, we are building things, right? Um, outside of ourselves, almost to worship them. It's almost like a fetishism. And it's it's been like that throughout time, right? If it's not the golden calf, you know, or if it's some type of religion, or if it's not artificial intelligence, we build these things outside of ourselves to worship them, you know, and thinking that they have all the answers when really sometimes we just have to look within. Right. And I think, you know, people like David Bohm, you know, they really started to understand that there's this interconnectedness that goes beyond what we can see, beyond our senses that we can really tap into if we just were to listen. Right. If we were to open our senses and really kind of um, desubjugate ourselves to this myth of the ego, then we can start to open up to what is possible in a real way. So I think that this transformation starts with self. 
right, individual, but I think as each individual becomes more sovereign uh, within their own agency, then they can start to build out into this collective kinship that really starts to, to branch out to this larger organization, uh, organism shift. And I think that's some of the work that we're really doing with the collabs is, you know, starting off with, you know, in Montana, we're bringing these individuals together to share with one another. But the whole idea of that is to take these decentralized locations and move them to be localized based in different places around North America and globally to where we can start to um, see what the solutions are on a local basis. So we don't get into that, you know, old adage of colonialism where our ideas are the best ideas for the whole world. We really start to look at a localized, individualistic, decentralized way of operating with our surroundings, our people, our culture, uh, and our environment. Absolutely beautiful. For the, um, I don't know if we've touched on, uh, enough upon it, but I, for the World Education Foundation, um, really in 2009, got a fabulous start. You're in 21 different locations. You're continually doing stuff. What's the stance of that? And, and what, what was the real reason for starting something that had to do with education? And um, I guess also one other question is, Sir Ken Robinson uh, uh, died on August 21st uh, last year, one of the great promoters of a different form of education for our world and, and uh, gave a lot of TED Talks and did a lot of actions as well around that. Um, what, does, what does what you're doing around education look like and why did you start? And also, is it more in the direction that Ken was going with the actions he was doing as well, feeling that our current educational systems around the world are pretty broken and, and need to, an upgrade to the modern day? Indeed. Yeah, you know, I, I think education is at the core of all learning and compassion, right? So you have to be educated in order to really feel or to create empathy. You have to be willing to take in something that you don't know. It's a humility that's into education, right? Where you, you are continuously learning that um, you don't know something, right? And you're continually learning through pushing yourself to your edges. And through the WE Foundation, you know, I thought that that was really an opportunity. So after football, I started traveling throughout Europe. Um, I had my mentor by the name of Dirk Van Berkel, uh, who really took me under his wing um, and uh, introduced me to a lot of uh, different individuals in the academic space, uh, the regenerative uh, technology space, uh, research and development, aviation space. And what I found is that there are a lot of patterns between the technologies that we built and the communities that we actually live in. And so when I was actually writing my thesis, um, after I went back to Lynn Sopian University to be part of this program called Adult Learning and Global Change, I traveled throughout South America, really with no agenda, but really just to relate to the people that were there, really understand the resiliency and what they thought about innovation and collaboration and all of these things that helped them to keep their communities together over millennia of time. And through traveling through about seven different countries throughout South America, I really, you know, the light went off. I was like, what can I do to actually give back? How can I actually be a vessel to take the knowledge and really transfer that knowledge into creating these, these you know, the visions or the steps um, and being almost like the facilitator to this change. And so what I saw is that there was a gap between academic knowledge, modern technology and local implementation. You know, sometimes in the academic space, we have all of the theories, we have all of the dissertations, we have all of the theses, you know, but sometimes that information stays in the ivory tower. So how do we actually co-create with, with those knowledge centers to really start to mobilize that information to where it can be very valuable in places, um, you know, around the world. So that's what the World Education Foundation was really honing in on is bridging the gap between this academic knowledge, uh, modern technology, and really looking at localized solutions um, and taking that and developing it in a customized way. So it's beyond just numeracy and literacy, it's really about development. 
you know, what are the things that are already there and how do we actually transfer other things and mold other things into that to create this co-emergence of something new. And so that's where the World Education Foundation actually spawned from. That was our ethos. And that's what really drove um, this educational aspect of, of that work. That's amazing. And, and w was there in, any ties later to to Ken Robinson and what he did or anything like that? No. Yeah, there, there wasn't to any direct ties, you know, to Ken's work. I really respect Ken's work. He's doing he I mean, he, you know, was the kind of the uh, a great thinker around education. Um, but what, you know, Ken's work did, it really helped to formulate some of the work that we did around the edge model. So we created this edge model where E stood for education, but instead of education, it stood for de-schooling. So really kind of getting those old pathways and really almost forgetting the things that we've been programmed to, um, you know, to come to see as reality or truth, right? Where do we start from? How do we orientate? The D actually stood for devotion. So this is more that ecological learning. How do we devote ourselves to this larger organism? And G was guidance, right? So this was more this relational learning where we can start to get this guidance from um, the, the, the ancestors that have come before us. What is that information that's embedded? What is the wisdom and the education that they went through and what are they transferring forward? And then the last one is emergence, right? And this is really that experiential learning where you you actually learn by doing right with the people that you're around who you're building these capacities with and you know through this edge model someone like ken um really saw that you know the education of you know you know the structures the more industrial type of education they are broken right um because everybody doesn't have access to the same resources but if you really start to look at pushing yourself to your edge wherever you're at there's always a learning opportunity so you know kind of reflexing off of some of the work that he's done and creating this edge model that kind of moved that forward and made it more localized and, you know i think that's where some of ken's work was really influential I love that. Really want to, you know, and with Ada, we, we spoke about this as well. With Ada, it's a cyborg shamanism. With you, uh, it's a more cyborg anthropology. Is it also cyborg shamanism? And can you explain to us, those of us who might not know what it is, and, and um, maybe even tickle or hint, you have an implant and what else is, <laughs> is going on? Give us, give us the whole uh, download on, on what it is and what you've been working on and what does that truly mean? And, and from what I understand, and also when I introduced it in, in your, your biography, it's not this disconnect of, of humanity, of nature, of environment. It's actually using technology to uh, connect you a little bit better in some respects, but I, I want you to explain it if you don't mind. Yeah, sure thing, you know, um, so kind of looking at the patterns that I was recognizing when I was traveling, um, I started to see that there was more things that were bringing us together than separating us, right? And I saw that in not only a human aspect, but a technological aspect. I saw, you know, this verge and this rise of this kind of co-mingling between humans and technology. And as humans, we've always been around technology. Fire is a form of technology, right? It's only this through this scientific or this technological process where we create it at, and to be technology. Shoes are technology, shirts, um, all different types of elements of, of, of our everyday lives are technology. But what I started to see is that there was this exploration that I was interested in through the interconnections between humans, living systems, and technology. So cyborg anthropology is really around this framing, you know, and our human relationships towards technology, just, and just to give a little bit of background on the interdisciplinary nature, uh, there's this woman by the name of Donna Haraway, um, and she wrote the first book in 1984 called A Cyborg Manifesto, uh, which was really the first widely read academic text to explore the philosophical as well as the sociological ramifications of the cyborg, right? And she, fur she further described cyborg anthropology as the study of how humans define humanness in relationship to machines, as well as the study of science and technology as activities that can shape and be shaped by culture. 
So, you know, that really fascinated me um, and it leaned upon a lot of what I was interested at the time of quantum physics, right? So you have individuals like Niels Bohr, um, who, you know, was uh, doing research and experiments, the double slit experiment, where you can see an electron being a wave as well as a particle. But what he didn't do was actually include himself inside of that, ops at that project. He was the observer, but he wasn't part fully of that aspect. And I think if we fast forward, there's this woman by the name of Karen Barad, who I got really, really fascinated by. And she has this concept called new materialism, uh, whereby matter is seen as an active force, not only sculpted by, but also co-produced um, in conditioning and enabling social worlds and expressions um, and life and this experiences. So if we look at um, you know, this new material, this concept of new materialism is really about breaking down the boundaries and breaking down the borders that separate us. So if we look at technology, you know, we are integrated just as I'm communicating with you. It's bits of information from me that I'm extracting through this technological device to get to you. And then ultimately it'll be transformed to getting out into your audience and whoever actually looks at those things. And I think this relationship between technology and humans is really being accelerated in this space and time. You know, we're talking about biology, we're talking about technology, we're talking about systems uh, change that is happening at a very accelerating pace. So, you know, a lot of times the change is outpacing the research of how and what those boundaryless uh, opportunities actually look like. So, you know, for me, when I went and got my, you know, RFID chip, it really was kind of as a provocation to myself that there are no boundaries between us and it, right? That there are no boundaries between, uh, you know, how I relate to myself as well as in a technological age, how I utilize technology and even through living systems. So the concept of cyborg anthropology really breaks down those boundaries, creates a discourse around what it means to be boundaryless, and then really starts to look at the ramifications as well as the consequences of this boundaryless relationship. And it gets back to that symbiotic relationship that we were speaking about earlier. Are there any specific things in your daily life or monthly life that you, where you actually use the chip or in, in certain ways, uh, how and, and if you don't mind telling us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure thing. No, no, no worries. So, you know, I got it back in 2017 um, and I was living in Norway at the time. Um, and so through that, we I actually got it on my birthday. We actually called it a chip and dip party, but that's <laughs> another story. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, through that concept, um, you know, I, I started to utilize um, it as a entry point to, um, so for example, I could use it to get in my office, right? I could just use my hand, you know, put it over the RFID reader and it would open up the door. Um, I could use it in getting on the bus. Um, I could use it to pay for certain things at certain places where my chip was actually identified. Um, I actually, you know, could store my medical records on it. Um, but then also when I went to Singularity University, you know, I wrote a couple of programs, you know, on some Raspberry Pis where, um, you know, once I actually, you know, swiped my RFID chip over the IFD reader, it could do different things. Like it had it on an actuator where we could move flags. Uh, it could turn on lights. So if I had a smart home, I could come home. Uh, I could just, you know, put it over the, the, the smart home and it would, you know, maybe during, if I programmed it for the time of day, it would have a certain mood, you know, that I would, that I could program it to. So it's almost kind of like, you know, a key fob, but it's an extension of my humanity. It's an extension of who I am. Um, so that's another way um, that I'm looking at, at, at actually utilizing it. Um, so yeah, I, I've been, I've been, I've been, you know, kind of searching and seeing how we can, you know, instead of looking always out, how do we look in, you know, so I'm really looking for the biometric feedback uh, type of RFIDs um, that can start to, you know, get a grand picture of what's going on in our bodies at any time, right? Are we low on a certain, um, um, you know, element in our body? Uh, do we need, uh, you know, different types of metabolistic, um, you know, uh, exercise or things of that nature? How do we take uh, these this bio uh, informatics and really start to make actionable um, solutions around that? 
That is beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I, I, sometimes I might I might ask some personal questions, but no, and I, I don't want for. to get too personal. <laughs> no, nah, that's um, what we're here for. <laughs> re really, the hardest question that I have for you today is the burning question, WTF. And most people think it's the swear word. It's not the swear word, even though we've probably all been frustrated and said that in the last 15 months. Um, <laughs> It's really what's the futures, and I kind of want your opinion, your vision, your view of what's the future, what's the futures, what do we have to look forward to, what's the roadmap, the plan, just in your opinion, where are we going? Mm -hmm. So in, in my opinion, um, I believe in um, decentralization. I believe that we're moving to a world where sovereignty is going to become much more important. I think decentralization of mind, body, and spirit um, is going to, you know, really connect us in a way that we haven't been able to connect before. Um, I think a lot of the aspects of uh, of, of way we're um, operating is going to be localized, but through that localization, we're going to be able to exchange information um, across borders. I think we're going to a borderless uh, community. Uh, you can already start to see that in some of the crypto space. And, and I'm not talking about just Bitcoin or things of that nature, but the objects, um, the objective of, say, blockchain, right, to really start to have these decentralized um, uh, aspects of proof of stake, um, where we can start to understand um, you know, the, the sovereignty. I think that um, our relationship with technology is going to continue to um, uh, emerge. Um, I think that we're going to have digital representation of self through artificial intelligence. Uh, that is, you know, we're working on a, a concept with Arizona State University right now, Digital Trust Office, where they want to start to explore what is possible around um, utilizing, you know, AI and technologies to really hold the sovereignty of information um, of students that are coming into the university. And I could see that, you know, there's some type of AI that ex that actually grows and explores with the individual throughout their life. And then, you know, instead of having all of your information out there in the world, there's bits and pieces where this artificial intelligence gives the only the relevant information to make a decision for whoever you're interacting with, right? So you're more sovereign, uh, you have a lot more, you know, centralized uh, type of uh, behaviors, uh, but then, you know, of course you have access to a larger uh, part of the world. And I think that we're moving towards more of an indigeneity, right? I think we're starting to move back more to the relationship of what it means to be human um, in a way that is a relationship to uh, our mother, which is the planet. You know, if we talk about technology, we are a subgenre of this larger technology, first with the cosmos, then to our kind of biosphere and our organism, and then ultimately ourselves. And if we look at it as we are relating to, um, this planet in a way, we have a really good opportunity to work with the earth, to tap into this knowledge. Um, if you look at the earth, it's gone through billions and billions of years of iteration, right? So if you look at it from a technological aspect, it has the answers, we just need to look for them. Um, you know, and I hopefully, I hope that we can start having conversations again. I really hope that we can start to open up um, a world where there's not, we're not digging our heels just into our own ideas, right? And our own thoughts and our own beliefs that we really start to expand our minds to what's possible and really looking at these diverse uh, opportunities to uh, really reconnect with ourselves, uh, the planet um, and our surroundings. So we, we kind of tickled upon it for a second, but you didn't explain it to us. And, and Urban Matrix One, Urban Space One, uh, if I'm even getting those terms right, can you tell us a little bit more about those? Those are some newer projects you're you're working on that are coming out. And uh, what are they? How are they? I've seen seen one of the presentations on Urban Matrix One. It looks fantastic. But can you give us a little deeper insight into that? And and how does it make our world better? How does it help us? Indeed. So, so Urban Matrix One is a project that was spawned out of my time at Singularity University. Um, so I actually wrote a PhD proposal around cyborg anthropology, and I was actually going to pursue that route, but I got accepted into the Singularity University. So I moved from Norway back to California. I was in Mountain View, and uh, it was a project sponsored by NASA and Google. 
And through that aspect, it was to create a business around climate change. So what I kind of put my hat on to do is actually how do we, you know, utilize um, technology in a way that can, we can tell new narratives to new stories, but really start to quantify the impact of what we were doing um, in humanity. Um, so with that, I created Urban Matrix One, uh, where we look at satellite um, technology information, as well as hardware, um, as well as coupling that with unique data sets um, and starting to gather the, and machine learning to gather the impact of economic, social, as well as environmental change, right? So it's no longer about kind of this, uh, you know, put your finger in the air and see where the wind is blowing to see what kind of impact it is. It's really about uh, using satellite imagery, almost like an MRI system in order to see where the vulnerabilities are. And so what we're doing with that is we're really starting to categorize all of the different elements from Paul Hawking, once again, the drawdown categories and seeing how we can create these buckets where we can utilize this technology to start to approach some of these larger um, type of global challenges. So when we think about refrigeration uh, management, which is the number one drawdown, right? How do we monitor leaks? How do we measure F gases? How do we look at supply chain to get that best last mile uh, of a refrigeration? Um, when we look at wind turbines or reduce food waste, um, how do we start to utilize uh, this the, the, the satellite imagery to fill the gaps of these missing data layers in order to expand through that? And Space Matrix One is really focused on the hardware of um, you know these systems. So um, right now I'm working with a couple of individuals out of MIT, some systems engineer there, um, where we're starting to come up with new concepts of how to create constellations of satellites that utilize um, more robust ways of, 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 of evaluating the earth or earth observation. So when we're looking at um, you know, uh, certain aspects of, of heat, you know, and carbon and even, you know, uh, heat islands and uh, infrastructure. Um, how do we actually come up with the systems that can gather that in the real way um, that's, you know, ecologically friendly. So using laser technology uh, to get some of these more robust readings down to the ground. Uh, how do we use the constellations uh, in a new way where uh, we can move them and that we can tether them to actually triangulate on certain areas that we can get 3D models out of? How do we use video recording from space to start to get, um, you know, different types of um, outcomes as well as uh, research? So, you know, those are the two aspects of what we're doing uh, with Urban Matrix One, which is more kind of the software side, and then Space Matrix One, which is more the hardware side. This is almost similar to the burning question, but what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Uh, you know, I, I think that that's a heavy question, you know, um, and that was actually one of our conversations is about balance, right? How do you balance 7.5 to 8 billion different realities into a collective reality? Right, and I think um, you know through that once again, it's about conversations. It's about relationality. It's about being vulnerable. It's about compassion and empathy. It's about setting up the structures to really understand that we are all human, right, and that we can find our humanity through our connectedness, not our um, not our divisiveness. And I think once we get and we start to tap into that power that we are all humans, that we all are uh, have a certain reality that we want to manifest. But as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else, we have the opportunity to live out that reality. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes, you know, maybe technology could be uh, a bulwark or you know, putting your hands in the dirt and actually doing some gardening and really starting to get that connection back to uh, the, the larger technology of the earth, right? And I think both angles, I think we're gonna see a bifurcation of individuals, right? We're gonna have some people that are gonna to wanna to be the first people on Mars, right? But we're gonna also have those individuals that are gonna to wanna to have their hands in the dirt and really start to kind of, you know, really appreciate um, this earth and this planet that we have here. And I think through those, di that, those dichotomies 
dichotomies, we can find some type of balance that really uh, puts our humanity at, at the forefront. Um, I think there's two, two big mirrors that, are, that we're up against right now that are really starting to reflect who we are as humanity. One of them is AI, right? And I think that uh, we are the training data for what that looks like. You know, humans are the training data for this artificial intelligence. And I think the second thing is climate change. It's really going to push us to our edges and it's going to be something that is out of our control. I mean, we saw a glimpse of it with the pandemic, you know, but as the world starts shifting and you start to get these sea level rises and you start to get these natural disasters uh, that are going to continue to happen, we're going to have to make a decision on what type of humans we want to be if we want to survive. So um, I don't know if I answered that question, you know, because I don't Absolutely. have the answers, but I think that, you know, that approach is something that we're going to have to consider. Absolutely, you answered it, and you answered it right. So you win the prize. There is no <laughs> right answer, and I've a, I ask everybody those questions, and I'll tell you every every answer is different, and yours is beautiful and eloquent, and it's one that can be applied. And it's really about we need to push everyone to ask themselves those questions, and those questions, the answers to those questions may change over time the 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 more the lights go on the more we have that knowledge that understanding that collective consciousness that collective intelligence and we grow um with uh as part of this symbiotic earth the the biome of our earth connects with the biome of our body and we realize boy we've got some repair and some restoration and regeneration to do so that we can we can live different when we start thinking about those questions then we we figure out ways to to heal and fix and to repair and to do the things that we need to to live in a better future otherwise it's just going to go uh like the other 20 plus civilizations that are no longer here uh, we're we're going to collapse uh, I have three last questions for you, and they're for my guests, really, for my listeners uh, of the podcast, those visitors who listen to us. Um, if there was one message you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change your life, what would it be, your message? Um, hmm. And even That's a great if it's question. two. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, you know, I think it's really about be kind to yourself and be kind to others, right? I think being kind to yourself allows you to be vulnerable, right? And, and not be shameful of having this experience. I think sometimes when we're human, we get shameful that we have to die, right? And I think that sometimes we feel like we have to do all the things in this lifetime, right? That we have to accumulate all of the resources and build all of the things that we need to build in this time that we're here. But I think, you know, if we start to look at what it is to be human and to be connected, we don't need all of the things that we think we need to accumulate. And I think through that accumulation and really demystifying the ego of like, you know, this kind of what we need to take over, we really start to see what we can actually be um, uh, able to experience in a real way. And I think that starts with being kind to yourself, being kind to others, um, and really integrating the aspects of humanity um, that would treat others like you treat yourself. I think that's the golden rule always, right? If that was your child, what would you do, right? And I think the, the, and that leads into the question that is my driving question always. Every day that I wake up, I ask myself, what type of ancestor do I want to be? And if I can answer that question in a way that it makes me proud, it makes me honorable, and it really aligns with my values, then that's the type of ancestor. I know I'm moving in the right direction. And I think that starts off with, if I was me, how would I want to tr be treated? Where would I want to treat someone else? And then through that aspect, what are the things that I can do to make sure that that person can feel the same way that I would want to feel? Um, so I think if we can get to a place of that, you know, I think we have wonderful opportunities. Um, there's more than enough abundance. The world has given us everything that we need uh, and more, um, a plethora of opportunities to really uh, reconfigure. There's enough for everybody, you know? Um, and I think sometimes uh, our ideas that we need to take it all in the minimal time that we have here on this planet, um, it really creates this disconnect. Um, but pass it forward, you know, look seven generations ahead. 
um, look seven generations behind and really kind of be honest with yourself where you are right now. And I think through that practice, um, you know, we start to unfold this co-emergence that's possible for the future. Thank you. That, that's absolutely beautiful. You've had these metamorphosis, the, the power, you know, the power of the pivot, you've, you've seen how powerful it is. And your life is, has, has been a pivot, you've lived it and experienced it as someone who's gone through that still going through it and, in other uh, journeys and experiences. What should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a real impact? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, explore, be curious. Um, don't be afraid to push yourself to your edges as I spoke about earlier. Um, and I think through this um, optimal curiosity, we start to find more about ourselves. Right, we start to understand that there's more out there than what we've actually been programmed to believe in. Uh, don't be afraid to uh, push yourself to things that you don't understand. You know, never say that it is impossible because, in some reality, in some dimension, it may be, and in some time slot, it may be possible. So, I think through this curiosity, we really push ourselves to think bigger outside of our boxes. Um, never be afraid to connect with someone that may not have the same upbringing or the same economic status or the same education as you, um, because there's different types of education um, that may not have been commodified that can be very valuable to where you're going on your pathway. Really look at those opportunities as putting another tool in your tool shed um, that you may use down the road. Um, and I think through that exploration and that curiosity, um, things start to unfold of what's possible. And then before you know it, you're thinking of a totally different way from a totally different uh, systems point of view. And you can start to make those connections uh, of what's possible. And one other thing is like, is this aspect of, um, you know, the, the design in which we are moving forward with I really believe, you know, and I talked to my good friend, uh, Kate Stone about this, but designing friction back into our technologies, right? We, where we, you know, I think technologies are designed to remove the friction and make everything frictionless, you know? Um, and I think what we really want to do is how do we actually have those really, those push our edges to where we're creating this friction that pushes us to our edges, right? And friction makes every moment mindful and meaningful and memorable. And I think those are the things that we want to take with us. So when, you know, we've had a full life, we want to know where those moments and those mindfulness and that meaningfulness actually happens. So um, I think I, I would leave it with that. Mm -hmm. Last question is, is, what have you experienced or learned in your professional life journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Um. The one thing that I would have loved to learn from the start that we are limitless. Yeah, that we are limitless in the way that we connect, that we have the ability to connect to everything that is that we're made of, right? If we look at it from the cosmos, and I don't want to get too ethereal on you guys, but from a spiritual aspect, I really feel like we're connected to everything, right? The stardust, you know, that Carl Sagan talks about, you know, the light that beams down on this earth that, you know, trans if photons actually carry information. There's information that is millions and billions of years away that reaches our planet that actually we absorb and we have access to. And I think if we understand that, you know, the earth has embodied the same elements that has created this large organism as well as the, the other cosmos that has been embodied in us, that makes us just as limitless as those spaces, right? That we are all connected and that we can tap into that information. And through that information, we find out the information that helps us to live an abundant life. And I think that, you know, through my practice and my curiosity and exploration, I, I'm coming to that, but it's still a, a constant journey. It's still a constant metamorphosis. And I think if I had have known that earlier, um, you know, uh, maybe I would have been able to articulate my mission and my path earlier. But, you know, I think everything happens in great timing. And I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, appreciative um, and grateful for my experiences. All of, I needed all of them to be who I am. Um, and I think 
through that practice, I'm going to continue to just, you know, be mindful of how I show up for myself as well as others um, and understand that I'm limitless in that aspect. Marcus, thank you so much for letting us inside of your ideas. That's all the questions I have for you. And I really have had a beautiful time with you. Thank you for putting up with my questioning and, and showing us such a good time, uh, letting us really inside of your ideas. And unless there's something you didn't get to say, or you really wanted to tell us, that's all I have. And I just really thank you and, and wish you well. Yeah, I just want to say thank you, you know, for the work that you're doing, the dedication that you've put into creating a more abundant world. Um, thank you for curating an audience that, you know, was mindful um, of these things. You know, you're really bridging the gap of what the future looks like. So I just want to give you your kudos, um, your flowers um, for the work that you're doing. And I truly appreciate how you're curating your space. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a sheer pleasure. You have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye -bye. You as well.